awesome. If you're online joining us, thank you so very much for welcoming us into your home. We're just so thrilled uh, to be able to worship with you. It's a, it's a question that's as old as time. What is greatness? All right, maybe it's not that old of a question, but it's a question we ask a lot, right? We, we have debates and arguments about what greatness looks like and, and who great, who's the greatest, who's the GOAT greatest of all time. Like we, we have these conversations around water coolers, we have kitchen tables, living rooms, in a car with our friends. Like we're always talking about what does is, what is greatness look like? So um, I, I wanted to share with you some, some people that oftentimes are, are talked about as, as what we consider maybe the greatest of all time. So the first one is Michael Jordan. Right? Anytime we talk about greatness, uh, Michael Jordan's name is almost always in the conversation about, about basketball. How about, how about maybe hockey? Hockey would be maybe Wayne Gretzky. And I already got pushed back from some people uh, on this one, but he's always part of the argument and the conversation. Maybe you're a baseball fan, so you think more like Babe Ruth. Right? Talking about greatest of all time, one of my favorite greatest of all times, Indiana Jones. He's like one of the greatest heroes you'll ever see. Uh, I think we have one more, greatest of all time. Oh, yeah, I don't know how, how that got in there. <laughs> Obviously, great is subjective, right? Like, we could argue all day long about what great looks like and who the greatest of all time in so many different areas is. But I think there is a definition for us. That when we look at this definition, it's something that's it's really hard for us to argue with because the definition comes from Jesus, and Jesus, I think for most of us, if we're a follower of Jesus, we would argue that Jesus is the greatest of all time. Like Jesus is the great one, right? Through this whole series, we've been asking ourselves the question, how did Jesus change the world? What, what did Jesus do? And, and the secret, if you haven't caught on to it yet in the six weeks so far of this series, is it was one at a time. One person, one relationship, one conversation at a time is how Jesus changed the world. Now, now we, as a, as a church, want to figure out how do we model how Jesus changed the world. And what we discover is, is that Jesus was never too busy saving everyone to stop and help someone. So how do we begin to do that in our own lives? Well, I, th I think the key for us is to understand that as a church, we don't change the world by prestige or financial impact or, or shame or guilting people, but we change the world by taking on the character of Jesus, by taking on the heart of Jesus. So today we're actually gonna dig into Jesus' heart. Like what is it about the character and the heart of Jesus that allowed him to change the world in such dramatic ways? And it really actually is quite simple. Jesus changed the world by humbling himself and by serving all people. That's the heart of Jesus. And today we're going to dig into a couple stories. So if you have your Bibles, I invite you to, to grab that. Uh, we're going to pick up in, in Matthew chapter 18. We're going to look at chapter 20. And we're going to look at, at John chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and mark those. We want you to follow along with us in Scripture because we want you in the Word of God on your own. Uh, but would you pray with me as we get started? Lord God, we are, um, as always, so thankful to be in your presence. And... Um, and God, we, we're, we're talk, we know we're talking about humility today, so God, we humble ourselves before you. Uh, we, we throw ourselves at your feet, and we worship you as our King and our Savior and our God. So God, we, we ask that you would just speak to us, your humble servants, that we may hear the truth that you have for us and discover how we can change the world as you've called us to by simply modeling how you changed the world. It's in Christ's amazingly powerful name that we pray. Amen. So his name was uh, Sam Rayburn. Sam Rayburn was a um, speaker of the house for 17 years for the United States. It's 17 long years of a uh, very prestigious, very powerful position. That position is third in line for the presidency. So something happens to the top two guys, guess who's next? It's him. There's a lot of power in that and a lot of prestige. And one day, uh, Mr. Rayburn got word that one of his journalist friend's daughter had died tragically. So the next morning, uh, Mr. Rayburn gets in his car and he, he drives to his friend's house and he knocks on the door. Um, the father, grieving father, opens the door and they have a, some small chit-chat, condolences are shared. And, and he says, is there anything that I can do to help you guys during this time? And his friend said, well, no, I, I don't think so. I mean, all the arrangements are being made. I don't, there's really nothing 
nothing that you can do. And, and, and Mr. Rayburn looked at him and said, well, have you had your coffee this morning? And he says, well, no, we've been so busy. I haven't had time to do that. So Rayburn busts his way into the house and goes into the kitchen and begins to make coffee uh, for this man and for his family. And while he's making coffee, his, his friend realizes that he knew that, that Mr. Rayburn had an appointment at the White House with the president to have lunch that day in an important meeting. And he says, Sam, aren't you supposed to be at the White House today? I don't know what you're doing here. He says, don't worry about it. I told the president that I had a friend who was in need. And, and what I love about that story is I think it models for us what greatness means for Jesus. Because here's a man who, like, again, third in line for the presidency, kind of an important gig. The meeting with the president, probably pretty important. But he knew, I think, what Jesus tries to teach us in Scripture, and that is that greatness equals humility. That if you want to be great, you're going to be humble. And I think this is very simply the, the message that we're receiving from Jesus. But this isn't the message that we always want, right? Like, we don't want to hear, hey, you got to be humble, like, if you want to be great, be humble. Like, we would rather it be something, I don't know, more powerful, more impressive, I don't know, more cool. Because there's a part of us, inside of each and every one of us, we like to be recognized. We like to be noticed. We like to be powerful. And we're in good company because the disciples were the same way. In fact, sometimes the disciples had these kind of awkward interactions with Jesus in these weird times and moments where they, they really outed themselves as being what I would consult, consider greatness hogs. Like they, they loved the idea of being great. And sometimes in some really weird situations, they would enter into conversations with Jesus that would kind of kind of out them in that. Listen, listen to the beginning of chapter 18. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them and said, truly I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes a lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, I want you to, to imagine this scenario for a moment. Jesus is in like his third year of earthly ministry. He's approaching his death. He knows it's coming. He's just started telling the disciples that he's going to die. So here's the scenario. You're approaching your death. You're approaching your last moments. And you tell your closest friends, hey guys, like my time here on earth is coming to an end. And you start to share your heart about that. And as they listen to you share their story, what they do is the first thing they say is like, well, hey, that, that new car that you bought, like, what, what are you going to do with that? Can I, can I have that? What about your house? Can I have your house? Like, what about all this stuff? Like, right? Like, and they're not even listening to the weight of what you're saying and what you're sharing with them. Instead, they're worried about your stuff and how they get their hands on your stuff. In a way, that's what's happening with Jesus. Jesus is like, guys, I'm going I'm, I'm to die. And their first question is, well, what seat do I get in your kingdom? Like it's, like, it's like they're not even registering with what Jesus is communicating to them. So Jesus' response to them and using this child is basically saying, hey guys, look, if, if you want to be great, stop trying to be great. If you want to be great in my kingdom, then you've got to humble yourself. If you want to be great in my kingdom, you've got to be humble. You ever spend time with kids? Like, and realize, I'm talking like the younger kids, like before we as adults mess them up, <laughs> like before they care what the world thinks about them, before they're worried about social status and prestige and power and all that stuff. Normally, after every service that we have, uh, that my family is here for, my wife will go and, and get my youngest daughter from the children's ministry, she's seven, and and when they walk out of the, the, the doors on the other side of the field, she will see me and you'll hear her across the entire field yell, daddy, and I'll look over and she runs to give me a big old hug. Eventually, she will stop doing that because it will be embarrassing for her. Like she won't want to engage in, in, her, in a relationship with her dad in that way anymore because at some point, you just don't want to do that. But when they're really little, they don't care 
In fact, when you think about like the, the young children, the type of child that, that Jesus probably presented in front of the disciples, they are just lowly by nature. They don't have power. They don't have prestige. They don't want it. They don't care about it. They're just children. And he uses that as a representation that, look, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you'll be like one of these. You will choose a lowly position. You will choose to humble yourself because greatness in Jesus' kingdom requires humility. Now, Jesus has this interaction with the disciples about a month or so later. He gets to have another conversation about the same topic, only this time James and John bring their mommy with them. So if you have your Bible, go ahead and flip, uh, flip the page over to chapter 20. Uh, verse 20 and 21 is where the story starts. It says, Then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favor of him. What is it you want? He asked. She said, Grant that one of these two sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. I think it's fascinating that they brought their mom with them. I mean, I think oftentimes we, we think that they um, may have gotten drugged there by their mom, but I don't think that's true. I think they actually invited their mother along. This, this is that point of the story where James and John bring their mom and he hears this question and Jesus like throws his hands up in the story and walks away and says, I'm done, I can't deal with this anymore. That's probably what he wanted to do. That's what I would have done. I remember when I was a kid, and I was playing Little League Baseball. You know that transition from T-ball to Little League. Like my dad as the coach isn't pitching anymore. The kids are pitching. This is big boy ball, guys. This is a big deal. And I remember like the first day getting your jersey on, your baseball pants, your stirrups. Like they don't wear stirrups anymore, but they're the weird baseball socks and, and the hat and got all ready. But before you go to that first game, you got to have that, you have to have that conversation with your mom, right? And that conversation with your mom is like, look, mom, this is big boy ball now. And there's gonna be guys throwing the ball and there's a chance, there's a chance I might get hurt. If I get hurt, your job, your only job is to keep your butt in that seat. Do not, under any circumstances, no matter how badly I am hurt, come onto that field because you will not embarrass me in front of my friends. Like that's the, conver somewhere along that line, you, like, you have that conversation with your mother, like don't, please don't come out. I know you love me, I know you care, but don't, don't embarrass me. Here's the thing, James and John are adults. They're not in Little League. And they're showing up to Jesus, their teacher, with their mother to fight their fight for them. I think oftentimes we, we see this and we think, again, like they got drugged there by their moms, but I don't think that's true. I think their desire for greatness was so strong that they would do anything that they could to get the seat at the right and the left hand of Jesus. So they brought their mom to have this conversation with Jesus. And this is how Jesus responds in verse 22. It says, you don't know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. I think the fact that they answered resembles, uh, that tells us they're okay with mom being there. Verse 23, Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink of my cup. But to sit at my right or my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they've been prepared by my Father. So there's some common ground. Like Jesus is like, yes, you will drink of my cup. You, you will. You're absolutely right. But I can't promise you anything. I can't promise you these seats. Verse 24. When the ten heard, this is, when the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers. Of course they were. I mean, this is like drama, right? This is like, anybody watch The Bachelor? This is what, like if you do shame on you, it's a horrible show. Like, this, there's a lot of drama going on. So they're indignant, why? Because it's not just James and John. Every single one of them want the right and the left seat beside Jesus. Every single one of them want to be great. They're not upset because James and John had a conversation they didn't agree with. They're upset because James and John had a conversation they wanted to have. And this is Jesus' response in verse 25. Jesus called them together and said, look, guys, you know that the rulers and the Gentiles lord it over them and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. 
So Jesus is like, fine, guys, I'll go over this one more time for you. Greatness in my kingdom is not measured by popularity or power. Greatness in my kingdom is measured by humility. Greatness in Jesus' kingdom is not measured the same way it is in this world. It's measured by our humility. If you want to be great in his kingdom, we'll become humble. It was mere moments after this interaction with James and John's mother that, that Jesus uh, kind of leaves town with the disciples and these two blind guys like call out to Jesus in the midst of the crowd and, and he stops. Like Jesus stopped and, and he listened to them. He didn't let his calendar dictate or the crowd or all the other demands on his life. He, he stopped and he, he gave them attention and he listened and he asked the question and he, he touched them and he, he healed them. Like these guys were in the presence of greatness. Not because Jesus lorded it over them, but because Jesus humbled himself and became a servant to two guys who were basically treated as outcasts by everyone else. But Jesus didn't just do this once or twice. This is, this is how Jesus lived. This is what Jesus does. So if you got, again, if you got your Bibles, flip over to John chapter 13. It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew, hear this, Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. Hear that line? Like all things under his power. What must that have felt like for him? I always wonder, like, what, what must it have felt like to have, have that much power? Was it like being bit by a spider like Spider-Man or being exposed to gamma rays like the Hulk? I don't know. Or maybe it felt like nothing for Jesus. Maybe we have this picture of power that's, that's so skewed in our world that we don't fully understand what it's like for Jesus to receive power because Jesus had all that power, more power than any other person has ever had. All the power in the world was given to Jesus and what does he do with it? He washes their feet. One by one, one at a time, he kneels down and he washes their feet. Now Jesus knew in this moment that what he did next was gonna impact his followers for the rest of their lives. And he chose to become dirty so that they could become clean. That he knelt down, he washed their dirty, disgusting feet with his bare hands, took the towel off his body, dried them with the towel, and he served them. Look, guys, this is the guy whose kingdom it was they were arguing about who was the greatest in. Like, <laughs> they wanted to be the greatest in this guy's kingdom. And this guy says, well, my kingdom is about this. And he kneels down and he takes the role of a servant and he washes their feet. And here, he shows the disciples and us the greatest example and lesson on humility without ever saying a word. They must have sat there in awe and speechless over what Jesus had just done in their lives. But look at what happens here in verse 12. This is after it's over. Jesus says, do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly, I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. The greatest leader, the greatest of all time, the goat, served in the lowliest way. Then he looks to his disciples, he looks to his followers, he looks to you, he looks to me, and he says, if you want to be great in my kingdom, you will do for others what I've just done for you. Shortly after that, Jesus dies, he raises again, and he ascends into heaven. 
and the disciples would eventually get it. It took some time, just like it does for us. There were some ups and downs. They had their moments. They had their bad moments, but eventually they got it. They figured out what it meant to be, to be humble. And, and through that humility, they launched this movement, this movement that we know as the church. And, and by being committed to the mission of making disciples of Jesus Christ with the example of Jesus' humility and the power of the Holy Spirit, the church is launched and grows rapidly. The movement that you are still a part of. As a follower of Jesus, you are a part of this very same movement. And because of that, the charge that he gives the disciples to be humble, he gives it to us too. The, the call for us to be humble is a call for all of us who call ourselves followers of Jesus to live differently. That if we want to be great in his kingdom, we'll humble ourselves. The author of Philippians um, just says it absolutely beautiful in chapter two. So just hear these words. It says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather, in humility, value others above yourselves not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of the others. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross. The word of God made flesh, humbled himself, became obedient to the father and placed himself in the most lowly position of a servant. So much so that he humbled himself to the point of death for you. That he took your place because he became so darn humble. Now honestly, I, there's a part of me that I don't want to read on uh, because my fear is always that these next few verses is something that we begin to just cling to unnecessarily so without understanding what we just read. But because of everything that we just read, because of the humility and the surrendering of Jesus, because Jesus became a servant, we get to read these words. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The thing that qualified Jesus for this honor was not his power, it wasn't his prestige, it wasn't his place in society, it wasn't his fame, it wasn't his notoriety. The thing that qualified him for this honor was his humility. The thing that qualified Jesus for this was being humble. Do you want to be great in the kingdom of God? Awesome. Of course you do. Humble yourselves. Do you want to change the world like Jesus did? Of course you do. Humble yourselves and serve others like Jesus did. Your first step is to trust Jesus. The second step is to begin to put that into action and actually serve other people out of that humble heart. Martin Luther King Jr. once said this. He says, if you want to be important, wonderful. If you want to be recognized, wonderful. If you want to be great, wonderful. But recognize that he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. That's a new definition of greatness. And this morning... The thing that I like about it, by giving that definition of greatness, it means that everybody can be great because everybody can serve. All you need is a heart full of grace, a soul generated by love, and you can be that servant. The amazing thing about Jesus's economy of greatness is that we can all qualify. You don't have to be the Michael Jordans of the world or the Indiana Joneses of the world. You just have to be humble. You have to surrender yourself and serve others in the same way that Jesus did. He, he washed the disciples' feet. The, the ruler of all things 
humbled himself to that position and he says very clearly, to show you what it means to serve others. You want to be great? Maybe it's time to be humble. So my, my guess is you have one of two next steps. Your, your next step could be very simply to begin to put that humility into action. You've got the feelings, you want to be humble. You want to be a servant like Jesus was inside of you, but you've never actually taken the step to do that. We've been asking you to pray the same prayer the entire series. Lord, give me your eyes for the one. And now maybe it's time to put some action to that, that after Jesus has revealed that person to you. Like, how do you serve them? How do you love them? How do you actually put it into action? But maybe for some of you, the step you need to take is that first step. And that first step is very simply, you got to trust him. Because the first step to being humble like Jesus is to place your trust and your faith in Jesus. You see, the disciples did that. But what Jesus was trying to teach them is the next step beyond that is to actually humble yourselves. I don't know what your next step is. I don't know where you're at on that, but I, I do know this, that if you wanna change the world, if you wanna make an impact, if you wanna be great in the kingdom of God, you'll take on the character of Jesus. And the character of Jesus is very clear. Jesus is very clear. It's humility. That if you wanna be great, you'll start by being humble. Would you pray with me? God, we, uh, if we're honest with you, we struggle with humility. There's always a reason in this world to find to not be humble. There's always things that, that draw us and compel us to seek greatness in, in so many different ways, but Lord, we, we wanna seek the greatness that you have for us. And in your economy, in your kingdom, we don't seek greatness, we seek humility. And we seek humility, you're the distributor of greatness. So Lord, we just wanna start right now by just humbling ourselves before you and surrendering ourselves to you. It's in Christ's name we pray, amen. Uh, we're gonna do something a little bit, we're gonna do something a little bit, there we go, something a little bit different. Um, we're gonna have this song and it's just a time for you to just be in prayer and meditate. You know, we do this thing called encounter and we'll do that here in a few moments, but, but this is different. We want you to just sit in the presence of Jesus. And, and maybe for you, it's just to, to think about and meditate about the, the level of trust that you've instilled in him. Maybe for you, it's about, it's about finding that humble heart, that character that Jesus has that he so desperately wants you to have because he does want you to be great. But greatness in his kingdom looks different than it does in this world. So we just invite you to just allow these words to wash over you, but more importantly, just allow the Holy Spirit to work in you during this time. I see a generation 
nation rising up to take their place with selfless faith with selfless faith oh I see a near about the humility thing or the surrendering to Jesus or maybe it's something totally different that you walked in here with today and you just need someone to pray with you and be that that person in your life would love to serve you in that way here in a moment um, also you received communion when you came in these are elements that are more than symbolic for us these are it's the presence of Jesus and his grace and this this means of grace here for us that um, it's a way for us to be reminded of of Jesus' humility. He, he died on a cross. He, he gave up his life for you. This is the, again, the ruler of all things. The one who the Bible tells us had all the power in the world. And he used it to give up his life for you. And this is a way to experience that grace and that love of Jesus in a powerful way. Uh, maybe for you, you just felt like the Holy Spirit's been nudging your heart, man. Asking you to take that step of just trusting Him. 
If you want to be humble, you want to know what it's like to be humble like Jesus. You want the character of Jesus, the heart of Jesus within you, but you don't, you haven't met him yet. You haven't really had a real relationship with him yet. And here's what I want to invite you to do. Like, I'm like, amazing leader over here, Zach, standing here waiting to have a conversation with you. Um, maybe baptism is your next step. And I'll be honest with you, maybe it's not. Maybe a conversation with Zach doesn't lock you into jumping in a tank today, but it's a conversation about what does the next step of trusting Jesus look like today? I want to encourage you here in a moment. I want to pray in a moment. And, and during this moment, like, here's, here's what I always say. Like, whatever the Holy Spirit's tugging in your heart to do, you should probably do that thing. Like, beyond anything I've said, do what the Holy Spirit's nudging you to do. If it's one of those three things, we're here to serve you uh, in that way. Would you, would you pray with me as we, as we go into this, this time of just engaging with God in a powerful way? Lord God, we... Um, we humbly surrender ourselves to you through our whole lives, but, but right now, even more so. God, we just throw it all out there. We throw it all on the altar, all of our, all of our darkness and our brokenness, our sins and our temptation, our hurts, our pains, our frustrations, our angers, our joys, our celebrations, our laughter, our happiness. We throw it all out there to you, God. We just surrender it all humbly, just throw it all out before you. And right now in this moment, God, if, if not for just the next few minutes, Holy Spirit, do what you want with it. Just very simple, God, just do what you want. 